All right. Uh, looks like we're starting. Hello, and welcome to Open Hillel's Nine Adar Interdenominational Text Study. We have with us here three rabbis, um, Rabbi Alana Suskin, Rabbi Joseph Kalikowski, and Rabbi Rachel Berenblatt, and myself, I'm Caroline Morganti, and Lex Rofez is also here, and we are going to be having a discussion on Parshat Korach um, with these three rabbis. Uh, first, I'm going to read their bios. Um, Rabbi Alana Suskin is an educator, activist, and writer published in dozens of anthologies and journals, including The Daily Beast, Lilith Shema, and The New Jewish Feminism, Probing the Past, Forging the Future, a finalist in the 2010 National Jewish Book Award. She is senior managing editor of JewSchool.com and sits on the board of Chura, formerly Rabbis for Human Rights North America. Rabbi Suskin is director of strategic communications for Americans for Peace Now. Rabbi Rachel Berenblatt serves con Congregation Beth Israel in North Adams, Massachusetts. She also authors a Jewish blog entitled The Velveteen Rabbi, which was named by Time Magazine as one of their top 25 blogs of 2008. Not just Jewish blogs, any kind of blog. She is also a poet, authoring the book Seventy Faces Torah Poems, and recently penned a high holiday prayer book entitled Days of Awe. She was ordained as a rabbi by Allah, the Alliance for Jewish Renewal, in 2011, and she received a further ordination as Mashpiach Ruchani, spiritual director, in 2012. Rabbi Joseph Kalikowski serves as assistant rabbi at Congregation Beth Sinai in Kalnyanga Lake, New York, and Crescent, Crescent Hill Synagogue in Rock Hill, New York. Previously, he served as senior rabbi at Congregation Kol MS in Richmond, Virginia. He is also founder and executive director of the Nachale Emuna Hasidic Institute of Virginia and has been active in college ministry, prison chaplaincy, education, blogging, political activism, interfaith outreach, and published translations of several Jewish religious texts into English. He resides in Kalnyanga Lake with his wife and four children. In his spare time, he is a fan of old movies, particularly classic sci-fi, horror, and comedy. So I'm going to hand it off to Lex, who is going to start by reading a opening prompt for our three rabbis to answer. All right. So as Caroline mentioned, we are delving into the, the story of Korach from the Book of Numbers. And the figure of Korach has fascinated readers of the Torah for millennia. Um, and my question for each of our rabbis is, to what extent do you sympathize with Korach's mindset and with his challenge to authority? Um, to what extent, alternatively, do you feel that his behavior was ill-advised or even malicious? Most importantly for all three of you, what lessons can we learn about the story as we explore our own relationships to conflict and authority today. So we will start off with Rabbi Rachel Berenblatt. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here this evening uh, with such a bunch of such luminaries. Um, so uh, sympathizing with Korach is an interesting question. I will say that I think I sympathized with him more 15 years ago than I do now. Um, maybe that has something to do with becoming a rabbi or just becoming older. I don't know. Um, but it's an interesting shift that I see in myself. I notice that my B'nai Mitzvah students typically take Korach's side from the get-go. Right? They say, well, what's so bad about Korach? He just wanted to democratize it, right? I mean, who elected Moses the leader anyway? For forgetting that no, I mean, the democracy was not the paradigm at the time when this story came about. Um, for me, maybe the most useful thing about the Korach story is that it teaches me something about how not to handle conflict in my life as a congregational rabbi. If someone in my community is upset with me and the way that I'm doing things, probably the right answer is not to say, okay, well, we'll have a throwdown and see who God decides is right. Or even, well, we'll have a throwdown and see who has the rabbinic ordination around here. Right? That's the kind of thing that I think can really get you into trouble. Um, the earth might not literally swallow anyone up, but there can be damaged reputations um, and hurt feelings and that kind of thing. Uh, just a, a quick reminder for anyone who uh, doesn't have the cross. The, um, 
he's discussed with Moses and Aaron, and, and he said to them, You're taking too much on yourselves, the whole congregation is holy, so why do you raise yourself above God's assembly? And um, Moses says, well, if, if that's really how you feel, we're going to have a, basically an incense off. We're going to each bring our incense pans in the morning, and we'll see who the Lord favors. And God favors the offering brought by Moses and Aaron, and Korah and his people are swallowed up. That's the very tiny version. Um, so looking at that as a, as a text that has something to teach me about congregational life, I think it tells me that behaving like Moses is probably not going to make me any friends. And that there will be people who feel like, well, why do you have all the power? Why is, it, why is it that you get to tell us what to do and how to do it? For me, the critical question is, was Korach actually acting out of a sense that everyone in the community was holy? Which does appear to be what he's saying. The whole congregation is holy, so why are you raising yourself up? Or is it possible that he was jockeying for more power, that he just didn't want Moses to have the power, but he wanted to have it himself? Because if it's about his own self-aggrandizement, then I find his, his challenge to Moses um, obnoxious at best and maybe toxic at worst. Um, whereas if it was really about believing that everyone in the community, ha community had the capacity to be as holy as Moses, that's something I have a lot more sympathy for. So I'll stop there and let someone else respond. Great. Thank you so much, Rabbi Berenblatt. We are going to shift over to Rabbi Kalakowski. Okay, I unmuted. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you for having me tonight. Um, and what Rabbi Barenblad said, you know, it, it reflects on the, you know, a lot of great ideas that we have here. Um, in the text that we we were given at the beginning, we we're given a very famous mission in Pirkei Avos, in Pirkei Avot, that says that any argument that's for the sake of heaven, its end will have a, 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 a will so full as that in the end it will continue to exist and anything that and any argument that's not for the sake of heaven it will its end will not continue to exist ain't so full as it's going to end so uh, meaning that it's it's either will it end or will it not end so the, the, when we see that something comes to an end that's the sign that really the people were not really necessarily having in mind one of the sides was wrong. And not only that, but it doesn't say the machlokas between Moses and Korach. What, later in that Mishnah, it says it compares different arguments. So it says which argument is for the sake of heaven is Hillel and Shammai, and which one is not for the sake of heaven, which were the two rabbinical houses in the times of the Tanaim in the and which and which <laughs> argument does not have an end? Uh, it's not for the sake of heaven, which its end it will not continue. Is the argument of Korach and all of his congregation? Korach v'choladaso doesn't say the argument between Moses and Korach. So that that reflects some very interesting points about this whole issue. Is uh, you know. There's a trope that we have commonly in the in Hasidic stories, and even to today, within the Hasidic world, machlokis an argument is very common between rabbis, between different different groups. Um, I remember when I was a rabbi in Virginia, I, I told one of the people in the community that uh, dissent and argument is sac is sacred in Judaism. And that person was very offended by such an idea. How can dissent, how can argument be sacred? You know, it's, it, it should be just the opposite, you know, we should, we should all get along. The thing is, is that the question is, how do we argue? Are we arguing, you know, it's obvious that the rabbis believed that, you know, from, from the, the context that we have there of, of that Mishnah, that Korach, he didn't have it in mind for the sake of heaven and that he was seeking self-aggrandizement and all of his talk about everyone is holy and everything was only just uh, to, to get people on his side and to become popular and he didn't really mean it. 
Um, that's certainly how the rabbis painted in the in the Talmud. On the other hand, however, we find in you know later, much later in history, the Hasidic movement tried to find the positive aspects of what Korach was uh, was saying, and and so therefore, all of this discussion that we have now, you know, that we say, you know, what what was wrong with what Korach said, it's not so radical today. Maybe in the when the Hasidic movement began 200, 300 years ago, then it was radical, you know. But nowadays, it, it's already ceased to be radical as, as the, you know, the Hasidim have become, stopped being so radical. So, you know, it's very famous that the, the uh, seer of Lublin, he, he used to call, he was a Levite, and he used to call Karach my, my holy uncle Karach, you know, the Hale Gefetter. Why? Because... He saw that there was something good in, in Karach's intentions. Uh, another rabbi from Lublin, who was not related to the seer of Lublin, was Rabbi Tzadik Cohen, And he talked about Karach as be, having in mind that he wanted to, um, that he wanted to uh, basically... I'm sorry, I can't mute that ringer. Hi! <laughs> bring, bring the phone to mommy. Go bring it to mommy. Say hi. Shlomi, it's okay. Hi. Go bring to mommy. Whoa. Um, sorry. Guide to mommy. All right. So, so, um, so, what did Ripsada Kukohan from Lublin? What did he have in mind? He said that, um, that basically Korach, what he he basically, his idea was that the messianic age had come already, that the world was perfect already. And everything was, um, you know, we were already in that time when basically what he was saying that the, you know everything will be everyone will be holy. And Moses' argument was, no, we're not there yet. Be a little patient. We're not ready for that yet. And um, that's another, you know, an example of of how the Hasidic world viewed viewed Korach. Uh, another another story that we have. Was that the Ismach Moshe from Ul, who was the founder of the dynasty of the Teitelbaum family, where Satmar comes from today? They said also, uh, he said that he remembered his past reincarnations, and he remembered that he was living in the time of Moses and Korach, and he didn't know which side should he take. And he said because of that, his family was uh, cursed that they, so to speak, that they should always have. Arguments, you know, always be involved in arguments. You know, the the old Satmar Rebbe, Biol Teitelbaum, he said about that. He said that, uh, he, you know, if if he was because of this from his ancestor, that even if he was alone in the woods, the trees would fight against him. You know that. But uh, the thing is, is that quite often he brought up that issue of how we can argue for the sake of heaven. We can we can argue, you know, and still love each other and still get along. And the argument, if the argument is based in love and 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 mutual respect for one another, uh, then it's an argument for the sake of heaven. And he often said, the Satmar Rebbe, he said that the the way to know if someone is being a zealot for the sake of heaven or he's just an angry person is to see how does he live his life in general. Is he in general, general, uh, you know, a curmudgeonly angry person who always is complaining about everything or is he generally a happy person and only when it comes to something for the sake of heaven does he get excited and uh, he points out Psalm 139 where King David says seek me out Lord seek me out to look, know my heart see is the, is the way of sadness within me the way of anger the way of depression the way of, of arrogance is that my way if that's the way, so then you'll see. Yeah, it's not really for the sake of heaven. But if you, if you're in general a happy person, and in general, you know, having, you know, and only get excited and fight, you know, when it's when it's something for the sake of God. So that's the the sign that's for the sake of God. Now, do we know? Now, if if the Ismach Moshe said he didn't know in his time, Hi. is he gonna? Is he gonna? Was Moses right or was Korach right? So he didn't. He didn't know. So if he didn't know, so who are we to know? <laughs> so apparently, you know, the rabbis, they definitely had their sign, and the sign was because it didn't end off good for him. 
But uh, until that point, nobody really knew. All right. Go thank, on. You, thank you, Rabbi Kolakowski. Um, next, I will I will pass the the metaphorical mic over to Rabbi Alana Suskin, and afterwards we will have a few questions. Uh, if if you would like to to tweet hash to tweet questions at hashtag Open Hillel, um, and you're watching right now, please do so, and we'll and we'll take those into account and continue. Our, our Twitter oh. handle is Open Hillel now, also. So I'll be checking both the hashtag and. I'll see if if I get notifications if you tweeted our username, you can do that too. Great. Uh, Rabbi Alana Suskin. Rabbi Suskin, are you there? I think we might have just lost you. She's muted, I think. Or not. I, I was muted. I, I lost the signal for a minute. I'm here now. <laughs> Sorry hey. about that. Um, so I'm back. Is it? Great. Yeah. Go. Feel free to go ahead and give us your thoughts on Korach, and then we'll we'll delve into some question and discussion. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. So I, I I lost the last couple minutes of that. Sorry, my signal dropped. But I I'll say a couple things. Um, you know, I feel pretty strongly ambivalent about Korach. It's, it's really hard as a modern person to read that story and not have some sympathy for the position of a, of a person who says, you know, hey, we're, we're all holy here. There's no, you know, you're not holier than us. We're a whole, a whole uh, nation of holy people. And yet, as somebody who, um, I'm very fond of uh, modern speculative fiction. I like to read sort of retold fairy tales, you know, where like Wicked, where you take the bad guy and you you read it from their perspective, and it's it's it can be really difficult to do that with Korach, particularly because the commentaries on Korach are they're not uniformly negative, but they're pretty strongly so, and it's very I find it um, difficult to to unambiguously say, no, you know, Korach was really, it was okay what he did. Um, and so one of, the, one of the ways that I look at the story is I, I like to, first of all, there's, there's a, a piece that I think speaks to me, um, which is actually very similar to um, one of the pieces Rabbi Kolakowski mentioned uh, with a slight twist, where the rabbis suggested that the reason that Korach uh, that his argument was not L'Shem Shemaim, was not for the sake of heaven, was because when he protested that all the people are holy people, what he was really saying was not that we all have the capacity to be holy, but that just in and of ourselves, without doing anything, we're holy. So no matter, it, it's sort of the perspective where, um, and, and we've all heard people say things like this, where, you know, each of us is completely holy regardless of what we do. And I think that, you know, that's that's a perspective, you know, looking at Korach and saying, if his argument is that no matter what we do, we are still extremely problematic. And I would agree that that's not, that's not an argument, L'Shem Shemayim. That's essentially saying, I will do whatever I want, and no one can say nay to me. And um, so from there, I think one of the places that I'd like to go is to talk about, you know, the role of rebuke in Jewish tradition that there's also a place for when when we sin, right? That there's a there's a sort of this um, idea that we hear pretty often, no one can judge me. You know, what right do you have to Um, it it's really a, a a not a Jewish perspective to say no one can judge me because we actually have as part of our tradition an obligation to look at other people in our community and say are they meeting a standard and not necessarily to go around you know poking your finger into everybody's pot but in the sense of when somebody is openly doing something wrong to say hey you know 
you're part of the community here and it's really important that you understand that your behavior inter impacts other people around you. And in fact, we have a, a, a large number of texts that suggest that we have an obligation to remove those who are uh, behaving poorly. And in fact, um, in the Talmud, in Tractate Shabbat, it says not only do we have an obligation to rebuke those around us, but no matter that we have an obligation to try and rebuke those who um, are even very powerful. It says, you know, not only should we rebuke those in our family, but if we have the power to do so, we should rebuke the leaders of nations, and even if we can, the entire world. And so you can read the Korach story from either side on that one. Is Korach taking the role of somebody who will rebuke the whole world, i.e., you know, Moshe, who is this very important figure who has a direct line to God, or is it the other way around, that he's he himself has uh, overstepped his boundaries and, you know, really doesn't ever want to be rebuked. And I think that, you know, we can look at that from either side. And so I, I definitely have a, a, a feeling that there's, um, you know, there, there's a, it's, it's not the easiest way to say, oh, Korach was totally wrong. But at the same time, I think rehabilitating him is not so easy either. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to jump into some questions and discussion for our three rabbis to engage with one another. Um, and the first question that I had um, related to a, a rhetorical question that Rabbi Kalikowski asked. Um, and he asked, how can argument be sacred in Judaism? Um, what what does that mean? Um, and and you've you've each touched on that to some extent, but I'm curious. Um, we're we're here meeting on a day of constructive conflict, and so there's been an act of decision to to celebrate to some extent, to observe, to commemorate conflict and argument. And the other word that we've heard recently from Rabbi Suskin is rebuke. So when you hear day of constructive conflict, what kind of conflict is that? And, and what kind of conflict specifically would you say is sacred conflict? What is the argument that is sacred in Judaism? And, and you can answer um, with your own modern thoughts or any relevant texts that you think come to mind. Um, let's start. Uh, would any of the rabbis like to start? Sure, I'm happy to chime in. Um, you, you asked about what kind of disagreement is sacred. Um, and the first thing that comes to my mind, actually, is a modern, a contemporary source, a book by Rabbi Brad Hirschfield of CLAL, the Center for Learning and Leadership, uh, called You Don't Have to Be Wrong for Me to Be Right, which is a tremendous memoir, and I, I commend it to everyone. It's really wonderful. Uh, what drew me to it was the chapter where he's talking about how, as a young man, he moved to Israel and became a settler in Hebron and how his thinking around Israel politics shifted and ultimately he left that community and now he's back in the States and he's leading a very different kind of life. Part of what I take away from, from his teaching is that a machloket l'shem shemaim, a disagreement that's, that's holy, that's for the sake of heaven, presumes that it's possible that as deeply as I hold my opinions, your opinions that are different from mine could also be right. I don't ultimate, only God ultimately knows the answers. And it's not a zero-sum game where in order for me to be right, you have to be wrong, which is certainly the way a lot of internet conversation takes place, um, which I think is not necessarily a productive way for us to operate. Um, in terms of tochacha, in terms of rebuke, I think that's one of our interesting challenges because certainly we do have texts starting from the Torah and moving forward from there which encourage us to bring rebuke to those whom we believe are acting unethically. And at the same time, how do we do that in a way that is constructive rather than destructive, that opens doors rather than closing them, that builds bridges rather than severing connections? I think those are my questions. 
Great. Um, Rabbi, Rabbi Suskin, would you like to speak either to sure. the question of rebuke or, or what it means for conflict to be holy or sacred? Sure. So I would actually bring two very famous texts, uh, both from the Talmud, as it happens. Um, and the first I would suggest as both a cautionary tale and um, an example of both argument L'Shem Shemaim and argument that is not, which is the story of Reish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan. Um, so the, the story about them is, it's actually a, a, some people would call it a love story perhaps of sorts, where the two meet. Reish Lakish has a, a very secular background. There's disagreement about exactly how secular. Maybe he was a gladiator, maybe he was a thief. And he becomes the Chavruta, the study partner of Rabbi Yochanan. And they study together for many years, and um, they argue very fiercely with one another. And the reason that the story is tragic is because the way it ends is one day they're arguing about um, making uh, knives or swords, and Reish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan have a disagreement about uh, the process of how a sword is made, and Reish Lakish insists it's done in a particular way. And Rabbi Yochanan says, you know, that the thief knows his trade, basically, and, and insults Reish Lakish um, by referring to the lifestyle he led before he became Rabbi Yochanan's chavruta and became his, his study partner. And in the end, what happens is um, Reish Lakish dies, and Rabbi Yochanan is left without a study partner, and he's in deep, deep mourning. And... Um, they, his, all of the other students, all the other rabbis, bring him one person after another to try and find someone with whom he can he can study. And they all are yes men. They're all yes, yes. Oh, I can see what your point is. Yes, that's brilliant. And Rabbi Yochanan says, I don't, I don't want a yes man. I want somebody who's really going to argue with me because without that person to sharpen myself against, the argument is pointless. And it's funny because it's it's got both of those elements, right? It's got the argument, it, the relationship between them allowed them to be really, really sharp with e each other until they went too far, right? Until the feelings got hurt and it, it destroyed everything. And in the end, Rabbi Yochanan also died because he he couldn't find somebody to be his partner in the in that really strong way. And so, I mean, it does demonstrate very clearly the importance of argument for the sake of heaven and also what can happen when that stops being for the sake of heaven and starts being personal. Uh, the second piece I would talk about, um, also from the Talmud, is the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, which is a discussion of the destruction of Jerusalem. And the reason that I would bring it for this particular piece is the story begins, right, with a man who invites... Uh, a man named Kamsa to his party, and his he brings the wrong guy. He has a similar name. His name is Bar Kamsa. And when the guy comes to the party, they've had this long, the two of them, the guy who get, comes to the party and the guy throwing the party has, have had a feud for years. And when he comes to the party, um, the party thrower tries to kick him out. And Bar is, is humiliated and says, no, no, look, don't throw me out. Just let me stay and, uh, and I'll pay you, you know. No, you got to go. I hate you. You're out of here. And he said, well, I'll, not only will I pay for myself, I'll pay for everybody. You know, he, go, he, get, he kind of, the ante keeps getting upped every time until he's offering to basically pay for the whole party if the guy just lets him stay and not be embarrassed. And in the end, he doesn't. He kicks him out. And this guy ends up betraying the entire community and plotting for the downfall of destruction. And in fact, Jerusalem is destroyed through his actions. And the clear thing here is, why does this happen? The Bar Kamsa says, well, it's, you know, the rabbis who were at the party saw this happen and didn't say anything, right? They let it go on. They let me be humiliated. And they didn't do anything, so they must have been okay with that. And that's, I think, also a very clear story. You know, the rabbis in the Talmud, they're talking about themselves when they tell this story. And they, you know, they say, we didn't take action. 
right? That's their moral. We didn't take action. We didn't rebuke when it was necessary. We stepped in and done something. And I guess those are the sort of the two pieces that I would bring as sort of examples of both rebuke and argument. Lashem Shammai, I'm saying, you know, both of these things are, um, are really important. And we also have to be really clear about when we ever bounce. Great. Thank you, Rabbi Suskin. Um, I think you. we're going to pivot to Rabbi Kalakowski. Yes. Rabbi Kalakowski, are you there? Yes. Hi, how are you? Yes, we're good. All right, so um, you got me? Yes, you're, you're good to go. Oh, so, okay. yeah, you're good to go. Hello? Sorry, okay, so I will... Can you hear us? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. You can hear me? Yeah. We can hear so, you. So yeah, feel free to comment on on any of the any of the discussion that Rabbi Suskin right. or Rabbi Berenblad have brought up, or or your own thoughts on on questions of rebuke of tocha or or any new topics you might want to bring up. Okay, so you know we, the the question was brought up you know before how can how can an argument be sanctified? How could that be sacred? Dissent and argument be sacred in Judaism? And the answer is that that's really a key to so many aspects of Judaism is basic humility. Is that, you know, we're not God. We don't know everything. We're not perfect. And so we don't have the whole picture. You know, God did give us the Torah, but that doesn't mean that we have it all. Meaning it's... It, it exists within the Jewish people. It is here on earth. It's not in heaven. God did give it to us. But does every individual who claims to have the Torah really have the whole thing? No, everyone has their own point of view, their own way of seeing even the same thing from a different angle. Uh, another, I, I know I'm keeping bringing up the Satmar Rebbe, but he, he said very eloquently, uh, he said that, you know, all the other Rebbes, he gave, you know, the examples of all different Rebbes. They all think everyone else is wrong, and only he is right, each one. And he said, I agree everyone else is wrong, but I'm also wrong. <laughs> Meaning, we all, we all fall short, you know. He didn't think that, uh, that, uh, that, you know, necessarily, you know, when it came to, you know, a particular custom or a particular approach, that his was the only way. He recognized that there's more than one way. When he made his community in Curious Joel, he specifically said he wanted to have you know, a, 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 a all different types of Judaism, Sephardic and Ashkenazic and Hasidic, mo it became mostly Hasidic, and that's all that's left. But when, when he started it, he wanted to have that type of diversity. Now, diversity is different than than pluralism, the way we talk about it. Um, and still, it there there is that aspect. Um, this is related also to the idea of tochacha of rebuke uh, in general. Levi Yitzchuk of Bardichev, the holy Bardichev of the Kedushas Levi, he said that if someone really loves someone, they rebuke them. Um, and that's the sign of really caring about them, is to be able to rebuke. On the other hand, we know, and the, 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 it says you know, in halacha that it's better not to say something that you know won't be listened to. If you know the person that you're going to rebuke is not going to take the rebuke in a positive way, it's better not to say it at all. And and in my own personal life, I've seen this. You know, recently, you know, I took a position, even as you know, someone. I didn't grow up in the Hasidic community, but I've adopted the Hasidic community as my own, and they've adopted me. And my family, and uh, and I love the Hasidic community very much, and the Orthodox community in general. And yet, I was having a hard time finding a you know full time position in the synagogue, and I got a job in a synagogue that advertised itself as Reform and Conservative mix. Um, and I went for an interview, and I got the job. 
So uh, I asked my local rabbi here, where I work as the assistant rabbi, is it okay, the situation? I told him the whole situation exactly. And, he, you know, there was no violation of, I didn't have to violate the Shabbat. I could sleep there. There was no microphone, whatever it was. They didn't mind if I prayed by myself and, and made the service separate for them. They didn't mind, you know, so he, he gave me the go-ahead. And I, I was more afraid, you know, I'm, I'm leaving away from him. And, you know, uh, you know he, he could use the help here that, and, you know, and I, I appreciate what he has to get to offer. Um, he gave me the go-ahead. I took the job. Then I got a pretty nasty email from another local rabbi saying, you're not a rabbi anymore. How can you take a job in a Reformed temple? And uh, from a, a Lubavitcher rabbi locally uh, gave me this very nasty email. Uh, then I went to a modern Orthodox synagogue to pray one night, and I got harassed by people in the synagogue there. What are you doing? You know, uh, you're a rabbi in a temple. You don't count for a minion here anymore. I said, that's fine. There's a minion without me. <laughs> they said, you know, there, all kinds of people were giving me a hard time there. So there in that neighborhood where the, where I was, there's a, a rabbi who was a, a student of the old Satmar Rebbe and very strict person and very, you know, with, and he always speaks his mind. He doesn't doesn't hold back. And he's he's always rebuking everybody. He's very... He's known for that, and people look forward to that. Some people, they enjoy to receive rebuke from him. And I called him up, and I said, you know, Rabbi, could I come to talk to you? I sat down with him. I told him the whole story, how I, I got this email, then I went to the shul, and I got harassed, and, he, and he's like, what's wrong? I don't understand. What are you doing wrong? He said, you, you need to make a living. You're not breaking Shabbos. You're doing good work. And, you know, it happens, the sitter that we use there, and that they always use in that synagogue, an Orthodox sitter, it's a Birnbaum, which is used in a lot of a lot of conservative congregations and even some Reform congregations used it. And uh, you know, he said, "I don't see what what are you doing wrong? What are you doing wrong?" He was very supportive. And then, so when you ask about pluralism, I asked him specifically. I said, "Well, what if you know, they, they, you know, obviously the the Orthodox and certainly the ultra Orthodox world." is not very fond of the egalitarianism that's that is the you know the standard today in, in reform and in the majority of conservative congregations today. and I asked the, the rabbi there this in the, in this uh, in this community I said so what if they want to call a woman to the Torah do I have to do I have to be meicher do I have to give tochacha do I have to rebuke them and say it's inappropriate and I and I said you know and I, I heard that by the Ben Yishchai, who we all respect in, in Baghdad, that once a woman was called to the Torah and, and they, they, he, didn't, he didn't rebuke. And he said, you know, it says in the Talmud that it's covered at Sibor, but the Sibor could be maybe Mokhal on the covered. I said, could I, would, do I have to rebuke them if such a thing happens? He said, no, you'll have no obligation to rebuke them in that case because there's more important things you have to rebuke. And even those things you shouldn't rebuke because they're not there yet. They're not. They, they're not going to hear it. You know. So if you're going to rebuke, you know, Shabbos is more important than that, than than the egalitarian issues. Um, so so why why so why rebuke about something minor, and not rebuke about something major that you know they're driving to shul on Shabbos, whatever it is. You know, you ha you're there to do your job, to say a sermon, to do to do what you have to do. Say a good sermon that that teaches emuna, that teaches faith, and that's it. You know, what, what, you're not. And, and he said, "I'm not doing anything wrong, and I and I have no obligation to rebuke something that because that's not, not their standard." And so we can respect each other because we have, you know, we understand. I always use the term that we see in the Bible in the Chumash, Ba'asher Husham that God saw Ishmael where he was. And when we're saying where he was, it doesn't mean a geographical location. It means where he was spiritually. At that point in his life, he was humble and penitent and looking, and God judged him not on his whole life, but on where he was at that moment. And um, the very first rebuke that we have in the, in the Torah, what did God say to Adam? Ayaka, where are you? And so that shows, even though there's so many more things we could talk about, that idea of where a person is. And obviously that's not the simple meaning 
of what God is referring to Ishmael there, where he is. But it's an understanding that we have to look at people where they are, where they're standing, where they're holding in life. And, you know, I remember it was the same question when I was learning in, in Jerusalem, in the yeshiva, in, in, in Or Sameach. I asked, that there was a Dayan there who taught us halacha, and I asked him, I said, you know, my, my mom's a big fan of the Grateful Dead. And uh, I saw a shirt that said in Hebrew, Grateful Dead, and I want to bring it to her. But I realized, well, maybe it's a problem because it's, a, it's this T-shirt, maybe it's a man's garment, and how could I give it to my mother? And so am I tripping her up, causing her to do a sin? And uh, this, is a, this is, you know, whatever, a, um, it, it's, it's short sleeve, so it's not necessarily the... Sneers, it's not the modest, you know, according to the halacha. And I asked him, and he said, no, he said, it's not a problem, because that's not where she's holding. You know, that's not where my mother's holding. So it's not to, I don't have to impose on her standards that it's not where she's holding. And uh, and so in that way, we can, you know, I, I'm just reflecting from my own experiences, what I've seen in my own life, how we can approach ideas of pluralism, uh, even in a context, you know, like this. Right now we're talking, everyone's talking on the internet about, you know, Netanyahu, he went to speak in the Congress. And and then the, the one of the Satmar Rebbe's, the one in Brooklyn, he called a protest to, to say, he's not talking for us. Now, a lot of people are upset, both sides, and what, and but, you know, and people say, you know, it's, why are you getting into this minutia of, you know, you know, instead of seeing this big picture of the issues with Iran, you look, you're arguing about little minutia of, does he talk for everybody, he talk for himself, he's talking just for the Israelis, all kinds of things. So, uh, so the, the, but the big point is, no, he, no one can say he talks for everybody. No one can have that arrogant claim, I'm for everybody. And, and I always brought up this idea, we see in the Psalms, King David twice, he says, I set before me always. He says, I set the Lord before me always, Shvisi Hashem l'negdi samid, and v'chatasi l'negdi samid, my sin is before me always. That if a person realizes, that's not a source of depression that his sin is before him always, that's a source of joy, that despite that, God still loves him, but he recognizes that he's, we're not God, we don't know everything, and that's the way we can allow God into our lives when we step aside and, and humble ourselves. So I'll step aside now also. <laughs> um, yeah, so Rabbi Kolakowski, you kind of already answered this question a little bit, but I, I wanted to ask also Rabbis uh, Suskin and Berenblatt, um, do you feel that there are any, like what modern context do you feel that we can take the these lessons of Machlochet L'shem Shemayim to heart, um, argument for the sake of heaven. Uh, well, <laughs> so um, there's certainly no shortage of modern discussions in which we might want to touch on those issues, but I think since Rabbi Kolakowski brought it up, you know, the discussions around Israel are really one of the most harif, the, the sharpest, spiciest discussions that we're having in our communities these days. and. So, um, you know, since this is a, um, a lot of us are involved in the open hillel and things like that, you know, I just want to say in passing, so there's two pieces of that. Um, the first is, you know, when we start throwing around epithets like, you know, you are Korach, right? Your, your arguments are not L'Shem Shemayim, you know, from whichever side of the of the fence we're sitting on, it's not helping the argument. It's not actually helping us. It, as soon as you bring that up, as soon as you say, no, you're not really in it because you don't care, you're doing it for whatever other alternative motives, uh, ulterior motives, that is the moment at which it ceases to be an argument L'shem Shemayim and the, you're losing the possibility of actually um, solving the problem which is at hand. And in particular I would say, you know, we we have over the last couple of years, I've heard a lot of discussion about, you know, we need to have a civil discussion, which is true, 
right? It's absolutely true. We need to have our, our discussions about Israel within the Jewish community be civil discussions. And yet it's, it's also ironic that as soon as we start talking about we need to have civil discussions, what actually gets dropped is the content of the discussion, which caused the incivility, right? Because there are real issues that need to be discussed. And there are real problems, and they're not easy, right? They're, you know, it involves multiple nations and multiple perspectives and um, real people who are having difficulties in their lives because of things that other people are doing and uh, because of government actions. And as soon as we start saying, well, the entire discussion is really about civility, it's not about the content of the discussion, that's that's where I would say that the, the the rebuke issue gets kind of drawn into it, right? When does something become so important um, that even though you know you, maybe they aren't going to listen to you, you need to say it anyway? That that I think is the the piece where the balancing act comes in incredibly difficult. On the one hand, as soon as you start calling people names, they're not going to hear you, and on the other, if all we're discussing is the discussion then it doesn't solve the problem. And I, I would say that of all of the discussions in the Jewish community, that that would certainly rank as one of the top three that were really, it's just such a such a difficult and spicy discussion that the, the issue of Korach is probably one of the best um, models, or maybe the worst model, I don't know, whichever one of the two it is, for discussing that issue. You know, there's there's others as well. You interfaith marriage and assimilation, and all of those things come up and get people very excited. But um, in each of those cases, the heat has managed to overcome the light, and we need to we need to sort of figure out where the balance between discussing rebuke and actually addressing the issues are. Well, I could just put a giant plus one to everything that you just said, um, because all of that resonates with me. I'm sorry, that isn't much of a machloket, is it? Um, I th it strikes me that this is equally true on issues of uh, politics within our own country. Looking at things, looking at um, the Black Lives Matter protests coming out of Ferguson. Um, looking at um, in any issue about which people are passionate, there is a danger on the one hand of becoming so attached to the idea that we need to take all different viewpoints into account that we're tamping down passions that really need to be expressed. And on the other hand, there's a danger of expressing those passions in a way where other people can't hear you and where therefore no good is going to be done. Um, sometimes I think the entire internet could use a giant lesson in Machlok at L'Shem Shemayim. There's a reason. There's that great XKCD cartoon of, of the little stick person staring at the computer and the other little stick person says, why are you, you know, come to bed. Why are you still on your computer? And the first stick person says, I can't come to bed. Somebody is wrong on the internet. <laughs> We've all had this experience. Somebody is wrong on the internet. I guarantee you right now, somebody is being wrong about Israel on the internet. Someone is being wrong about Ferguson, someone is being wrong about Netanyahu. No matter where we fall on these issues, you can find somebody out there who's really going to take you off. So for me, the question is, how do we engage with each other in a way that's constructive? Because it is really easy to find people who annoy you on the internet or in the Jewish community and yell at them for having a different opinion than you do. But I don't think that gets us anywhere. I don't think that gets us any closer to you know, to the to the redeemed world that we're all looking for. Right. I think we do. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, I mean, a question that I had, which was just kind of jumping off of something that Rabbi Kolakowski said, um, is the 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 part of. Um, the idea that you shouldn't rebuke someone if they're not going to hear you. Um, and for me, I think that it's in general a good idea, but I also think that it's it's sometimes hard to draw a line because I, I think that, you know, even if someone isn't going to listen, what if what they're doing is is really bad enough that you feel the need to speak out even if you don't think that they're going to listen? Um, and like, to what degree of certainty is required that they're not going to listen? 
because I mean that's kind of also a sort of a subjective thing. So I was wondering if anyone had any thoughts on that. Um, well, <laughs> I, I would suspect that the actual, it depends, because we're Jews, right? Um, however, I would say there, there actually is some discussion of this in the, in the Talmud itself. So I, I earlier talked about, um, you know, there's that, the passage in Shabbat that talks about, you know, you should rebuke even the whole world, um, you know, if you have that power. And if you go on just a little bit further past that section of the Talmud, there's a whole discussion about, um, there, uh, there's a story. And the story talks about uh, a sinner and God destroy that. This is actually from, um, from the writings that he's going to send uh, angels down to mark the foreheads of the elders, right, who ostensibly were not sinners. And the, um, the Talmud actually goes to a very interesting place with this and says, instead of just taking this as a very straightforward passage, it breaks the passage up and has the, the angels asking God, well, why are you, mar you know, the, the marking of the people who are innocent, how do you, why are they innocent? They, they didn't intercede. They didn't go around and rebuke the other people who are sinning. So really, they themselves are sinners as well and there's an argument between the angels and God and in which the the discussion is well they they couldn't you know they knew right that if they rebuked them you know no, they wouldn't do anything and they in uh, actually I guess it's truth it, the embodied truth um, you know who's uh, symbolic I guess um, and says well you know they couldn't they couldn't have known you knew but they couldn't have known. And so ultimately the, the Sugya and the Talmud, the story in the Talmud, holds the elders themselves responsible for not rebuking these people, even though they themselves didn't engage in the sins. So does that actually help us? Probably not. <laughs> but it's an interesting discussion, right? Because it actually says, you know, it's, it's really never possible to know whether or not your words will have effect. So you have to try. Um, if you see that people are sinning, then, then the question becomes, you know, at what level is the sin uh, great enough that you need to intercede, right? Or that your society that you need to intercede with because you see it going down a bad path. And I, these are all questions that they're not so easy to answer. <laughs> they're, um, you know, if, if, you know, is it, is it to write to write an article? Is that enough, or should you go around knocking on doors and saying, "Hey, you know, I see you've got pork in your in your grocery basket. You know, bad. Shame on you. Eh, it's not going to get you so far." So, how you make that decision? I, you know, I I think that's a more complicated question. I don't know. Maybe uh, Rabbi Berenblatt has some ideas. I I don't. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that, Rabbi Berenblatt. Did you have any thoughts on that question, Rwanda? Boy, you know, I, I mean, it, it strikes me that that we could go on about this probably all night, um, because clearly we all have a, a lot of thoughts to offer and a lot of things to say about these questions. Um, and and I and I'm aware that our time is brief, so I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna toss it back to to you, Lex and Caroline. Uh, if there's a last question, although, or maybe maybe toss it back to Rabbi Kolakowski if he would like to chime in. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we do have um, like one last question that we kind of wanted to wrap up with, which was just kind of a general um, kind of overarching. What is like the biggest lesson that we should take from the story of Korah? Um, so yeah, I guess we have five minutes left. So if anyone has any final thoughts, I think it would be great if you could all share. Yeah, and uh, let's let's go in the reverse order that we started in, um, so that we switch off who has to go first. Um, let's start with Rabbi Suskin for for final thoughts. I 
I think you're muted, Rabbi Suskin. There we go. Okay. So um, the moral of the story. Well, <laughs> there's many morals to the story. You know, I would say that it, when I walk away from the Korach story, I don't usually feel like Korach is a hero. Um, and as I opened with, I said, you know, he's an, he's an ambiguous figure in a lot of ways, and I feel ambivalent about the way we approach him. Um, the, the moral of the story, I mean, obviously one of the morals is that we really need to not be calling each other Korach. Um, whether or not Korach is a, a, a heroic figure or whether he's an evil figure, you know, that's not really our place to decide. It, you know, maybe the, maybe the earth would not have had to open up and swallow the rebellion had there been some other way to deal with him. You know, maybe there could have been a discussion about, hey, what is it exactly that you're protesting? You know, he says, we're all of us holy. But even today, we're arguing about, well, what did he mean when he said that? Maybe it would have been more effective to say, well, what did you mean when you said that? Instead of saying, well, time to open up the earth and swallow you. I don't know. I, um, I'm not sure there is a moral to the story. But I do know that in terms of the way we interact with each other today in the Jewish community, that moral, I think, is more important, which is that we no longer live in a place where we can count on everybody having the same view, if there ever was such a time and place, which I doubt. But certainly it's not true now. And so, you know, when maybe, you know, even though we know that, you know, the majority of American Jews vote Democratic, that doesn't mean we're all Democrats. And it, Furthermore, even if I happen to agree with X, Y, and Z, that doesn't necessarily mean that I cannot learn something from someone who has a really different perspective from myself. And in fact, just as a personal matter, I found that when I'm able to have conversations with people with very different perspectives, I almost always walk away knowing more than I did when I came to the conversation. And to but if I can start out by assuming that the person has real and legitimate reasons for the positions they take, that's a, that's always a better approach than assuming that they're really out doing some kind of evil deed because, hey, they get off on being evil. That's I've just never found that to be true. I mean, you know, there may be a few people out there who really are genuinely wretched people, but by and large, people actually have reasons for nearly everything they do, and it's worthwhile to try and find out what they are. And so I guess if we were, we're going for a Korach moral, the moral is don't be Korach. All right. Um, next up, let's go on over to Rabbi Kolakowski for some final thoughts. All right. Thank you very much. Just a, a quick idea about the other question we had before in, his, in Ezekiel 33 in the Bible. We have a very famous passage where Ezekiel, where God tells Ezekiel, you know, if you don't blow the horn, you're in trouble. But it's your fault if the people get, you know, get marauded, you know. But if you blow the horn and they don't listen, so then that's, so then you, you, you did what you had to do. Um, just the question is, how do you blow that horn? How do you get the message out? And if you get a message out that, you know, will be negative, not only will it be ignored, it's one thing, if the message will be ignored, I don't see necessarily a problem in bringing it out. If the message is going to bring antagonism against the message, so then that's probably the point where it's really impossible to to argue back. And that's reflected in the Talmud where, you know, it says in Pirkei Avos, you should know what to answer a heretic, but then the in, Pirke, in the Mishnah there, in the, in the Talmud, in Sanhedrin, other places, says, well, that's talking about one type of heretic, you know, but not another type of heretic who's just going to say more, more bad things. He's not going to accept the answer. That's one thing. Um, but as far as this question is, what's the message of Korach? And I think it's related to this as well, you know, and, and it's related to whatever Suskin said also, uh, very, very pointedly how she said that, you know, whenever we engage in discussion, we always come out with learning something new. And, and I think that's reflected to what it says 
um, B'nai Korach lo mesu. The Korach's children did not die. And that means that there is always something left over to, for the next generation. There's always something that's gained. You know, so, so if Korach's children didn't die, and we have psalms that were written by the sons of Korach, and we have, and we have you know, we say that in our liturgy, the psalms of the children of Korach. Uh, that means, you know, the same idea. It says in the Talmud that Haman's great-grandchildren taught Torah in B'nai Brak, and some suggest that that was Rabbi Akiva, that, you know, since he came from a family of converts, that maybe that he was a descendant even from Haman himself. And... Uh, and I see that in my own life, you know, I, I have friends of mine who have, within the Orthodox world, have very controversial views. And, I, and a lot of people on the internet mostly, or even in person, are always putting them down and saying, what do you, what do you, you know, you're a heretic, you're no good, you're an evil person, and this and that, and making all kinds of accusations against them because this one... One, for example, he believes that Jews should go out and proselytize, you know, which is, everyone says we don't do, you know, but he says we do, you know, and I've heard other rabbis say that too, you know, and so they say, well, he's not big enough to say that, all right, so whatever it is, you know, or another one doesn't believe in Kabbalah or this or that, and, this and, and, they, and people ask, well, why are you still engaged with them? And I say, well, I always learn something from them, and even from my own perspective where I disagree, I can understand my own views better based on those arguments, and that's the same thing with interdenominational inter and interfaith discussion, we always wound up, wind up learning more about ourselves when we engage in dialogue with others. And that's that message of B'nai Korach Lo Mesu. There's always, the, the children of Korach, they didn't die. There's always something that's left, and the Midrash tells us that Korach, to this day, is still saying, Moshe Emes Vitaraso Emes, that Moses is truth, and his teaching is true, and uh, I, I, you know I don't mean to be pontificating, but it's, it is something I believe. <laughs> so that's something also we can end off with. But that idea of b'nei korach lo mesu that there is always something to be gained by every discussion that we have. We always learn more, and so that's a phenomenal thing. Thank you. I mean, thank you, young guests that came briefly. Um, <laughs> I, I enjoyed their guest appearance. Um, let's wrap up with Rabbi Berenblatt. It's a little bit of a truism at this point to point out that, that the Talmud frequently preserves both sides of an argument. Sometimes one voice comes as the anonymous voice and it doesn't get the, a name, but there's almost never an instance where you get only one point of view and that's it, no one ever said anything else, no one ever had any other way of thinking about it. Um, and I think that's one of the really beautiful things that our tradition has to share with the world, that all of these divergent voices are part of the same text, they're part of the same tradition, they're part of the conversation. And I think that's what we are called to do on whatever issues it is that, di that divide us. Um, to at least honor the possibility that the other person might have a point, to honor the certainty that the other person is part of the conversation, even if we disagree with them. Right? Like, this person is still in my family, right? We'll still have Seder together, even if one of my parents is a Republican and one of them is a Democrat. For the 60 years of their marriage, they've been canceling out each other's votes, but it's, you know, that's okay. That doesn't mean they love each other any less. And I feel like that's in some way a useful model for us as the Jewish community, maybe for us as the world, is how can we continue to have Shabbos together, have Seder together, do the work we need to do in the world together, even when we disagree? And also, how do we balance that desire to find the partial truth in the opinions with which we disagree with a desire to really stick to our guns and stand up for what we deeply believe in and our deeply held convictions? I think that's the work. I think that's the work that's ahead of us. That's what we're here for. Awesome. Thank you, Rabbi Berenblatt. And it's time for us to wrap it up. Uh, I want to thank all three of our rabbis for spending a little over an hour um, of their time, given the fact that we went five minutes over and the technical difficulties we had a little bit of in the beginning. Um, Yes, this was a, the first time we've ever done this in this 
went really well, and I think everyone had a great time. And hope to have something like this again sometime. Um, have an easy fast if that's what you're doing tomorrow. Um, see you later.